Good morning, everyone. As Atman said, my name is Badri, and I would also like to welcome you to our Sunday service, those here in the Temple of Light and Nanda Village, and joining us online as well. It does never fail to bring joy and gratitude to be together for this service. Um, I'll begin with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, Paramahansa Yogananda's Book of Prayers and Poems. This is number 63, Spiritualize All Our Thoughts and Ambitions. O infinite alchemist, spiritualize our weaknesses into strength and our wrong thoughts into right thoughts. Grow thou a flower of divine understanding from every seed of activity. With the magic wand of foresight given by thee, teach us to transmute the ugly imps of selfish ambition into fairies of all serving noble aspirations. Train, Lord, each stallion of desire to become a champion racing for thine abode. Transform our base ignorance into the gold of wisdom that had become a liquid stream of spiritual gold rushing steadily to thy shore. <clears throat> so today's reading on the subject of soul receptivity and attunement is an excellent reading that says a great deal, both said and unsaid in a brief uh, passage. And Yogananda emphasized, as it says, uh, this quote from the Bible, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, and this need for attunement again and again to his close disciples and spiritual seekers. And as I was reflecting on what does this mean, this attunement, I thought, uh-oh, it may be that we need to be in tune to figure it out. And yet, I, at that same thought came the reassuring thought that, no, we have the necessary foundation of attunement, or we wouldn't be here in this very temple. Uh, even for the first time, or turning in online, we wouldn't be participating in a Sunday service like this that dives into the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda and self-realization if we didn't have, as Jesus Christ said, our house built upon a foundation of stone so that the teachings and the blessings of God and the masters are our foundation and our basic attunement that we can build and live in the house of our spiritual lives upon that strong foundation. Um, on a certain level, I think that our attunement comes down to a kind of very basic spiritual common sense. Um, there's certainly more to it, but uh, for example, there was once a few disciples who were gathered and they were kind of comparing notes on their spiritual teachers, on their gurus, which mind you is never a very advisable thing to do. But the first one said that his guru was so great that he could go days and days without taking any food. And so kind of impressive. And the second disciple was warming to the subject and kind of bragging also that his guru was so great and had such self-control that he could go days and days, even weeks without sleeping at all. And that third disciple had them beat because he said his guru was so great and so wise that he would eat when he was hungry and sleep when he was tired. <laughs> And so, of the many, you know, spiritual priceless gems that Paramahansa Yogananda and this path of self-realization has given us, answers to the great spiritual questions, you know, spiritual techniques like Kriya Yoga and Hong Sa, meditation to, to be in tune with God, and on and on, you know, the teachings give us these opportunities to be in tune. Um, Yogananda has given us this priceless spiritual practicality, this wisdom that is both lofty and ideal and has tremendous potential for spiritual enlightenment and also supremely practical and in tune with reality of our individual lives and of the world that we live in. And so also if you think of the kind of qualities that exist within a place like Ananda Village and Ananda, our great spiritual family, around the world. The qualities that make Ananda work and that have for more than 50 years come down to basic 
things like kindness, cooperation, harmony, and, and just goodness. And Swami Kriyananda, our teacher and our founder, he gave us these guiding principles, these simple but powerful guiding principles that people are more important than things and that where there is dharma and right action, there is victory and spiritual success. And so he could have given us something like tatvamasi, thou art that, or yoga chitta vritti nirod, but he gave us these guiding lights of goodness and of individual spiritual well-being to guide us in our path to spiritual enlightenment, both individually and as a community and as a divine family. On a deeper level, because attunement goes far beyond just the practical or the mundane, of course, our spirituality to be in tune on this spiritual path and in the teachings and the grace of Paramahansa Yogananda, it comes down to a relationship. For many of us as disciples of Yogananda, it comes down to a guru and disciple relationship, whereby we accept the guru into our lives as a channel for God, for Divine Mother, for Spirit, and that the spiritual qualities of discipleship become, again, these pillars in our lives, like loyalty, like, uh, like again, right attitudes that bring us to God, and above all, I would say, devotion to God and to the Guru. And the subject or the idea of right attitude there was once another disciple who was seeking admittance into his guru's ashram or his would-be guru's ashram. And the guru said that he would accept him if he would take a vow of silence and be permitted to only speak every 12 years. And so the disciple accepted these terms and entered the guru's ashram. And after 12 years of devotion and of silence in this practice, he said to the guru, the food in the ashram is very bad. <laughs> and so he stayed on the course for 12 more years of silence and practice in this way. And again, 24 years of discipleship in the ashram. And this time the words he chose to speak were, the bed is very hard and uncomfortable in the ashram. And so finally 12 more years passed and 36 years in the ashram, the disciple had his last chance to speak you know, to the guru and he just said, I quit. <laughs> and the guru replied to him, good, all you do is complain. <laughs> and so again, and Yogananda emphasizes this teaching, but that, and, and Swami Kriyananda as well, on and on, that the right attitude will take us either a great deal all the way, even on the spiritual path, or not very far at all. And so again, this has its under, Pinnings in common sense and practicality that a basic attitude of, of right living, of, of these, again, principles of cooperation and kindness, and just basic positivity will keep us in tune with God. As Paramahansa Yogananda once said, do not tie my hands with negativity. And so the positive flow in our lives will keep us in tune with God and with Guru. There is the practice of devotion on the spiritual path that is perhaps above anything else, uh, the thing that can keep us in tune with God. And devotion is a very individual and personal thing in our relationship with God, with the divine. Um, many of us here at Ananda received recently as a gift from a friend, a community member here, Naiswami Lakshman. And it's a little book um, that was unusual to me anyway, a print and translation of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrections, Practicing the Presence of God. And as I read this book recently, probably many of you have or maybe are, it's some 70 or 100 pages and um, it's inspiring, it's beautiful. I also, as I read through these chapters and these things, I thought, boy, all this guy talks about is one thing, practicing the presence of God. He's extolling, you know, others in the church and he's writing letters to individuals and talking to priests and just imploring everyone to this simple practice of the presence of God. 
But, and it is very inspiring. It obviously sanctified this individual and had the power to be a light and a, a spiritual help to many others. But there's one practice that I've been drawing on and kind of adapted from that book that I'll share and recommend to everyone heartily that he basically says to pause as frequently as we can, as we think of it in our daily lives and at any time and to simply call to God. You can close the eyes, you can keep them open, you can even do this now. And just, he said, call to God with some simple phrase, such as, Lord, I love thee, or dear God, I am thine. And so speaking from the language of our hearts to God in this simple practice of devotion at any time, gradually as he found all the time, keeps us in tune with this divine flow and this grace of God. Now, loyalty is another important aspect of discipleship and of the spiritual life. Yogananda said loyalty is the first law of God. And I believe as with all spiritual principles, there are many kind of layers and even nuances to what it means, in this case, loyalty to God or to the guru. But on a basic level, I believe it's of supreme importance because Loyalty is the courage of our hearts and the conviction to seek God and to love God and to follow the Guru no matter what comes in our lives and all the time. Now, there's another aspect to this teaching of attunement that has a more outward expression, or at least a partially outward expression, and that is the aspect of seeing God in others and everywhere. In, in life, because it's not only an inward practice, of course. And Paramahansa Yogananda uh, kind of relates this in an experience of his in Autobiography of a Yogi, that many of you re recall. And when he goes to this well-known sacred spiritual site at a place called Tarakeshwar, and there's a divine stone there that he goes to visit, and he's offering his devotion, but he's not really in the mood to bow before the stone, which is what would be traditional. He just wasn't really feeling it as a, this outward expression of this, this stone and this traditional symbol of the divine. And so he goes there perhaps a little half-heartedly and goes on his way. And at this time afterwards in the story, he's seeking out a great guru, a, a saint called Ram Gopal Muzamdar. And when he finds him, Ram Gopal reminds him because on the way he gets lost and kind of goes through some little hardships. And Ram, Ram Gopal reminds him, just as you failed to bow before this statue, this image of God, he said, the strangers who you asked directions from, they failed to pay attention to the uh, distinctions of right and left. And so they sent him you know, through these rice patties and well along his way. And of course, Yogananda is going through this experience as a lesson for himself in this kind of story, but to all of us, to pay respect to God in every form, perhaps in a stone symbol in a temple, but to others in our lives and you know, in our workplace or in our relationships, that we see God and we respect and serve and love God everywhere, and especially in other people and in our relationships with others. I came across a study recently um, that I, perhaps some of you have heard of also. I heard it featured on National Public Radio and um, it's one of the longest, if not the longest studies running on human happiness. And it started in 1938 and it's called the Harvard, Harvard Adult Development Study. And the current director was being interviewed, Dr. Robert Waldinger, I think. And he was talking about the many complex variables that they've studied, you know, relating to happiness and what brings happiness in people's lives. And it was interesting, he said they're studying the children and even the grandchildren of the original subjects, of which there are only a few left. And as he was saying, and there's a whole book on the subject, and this was a short interview, but it was very interesting that he said in all this kind of complex data that they've compiled and the many, many variables that are in a study like this, he said it really came down to one thing in this study, that people's happiness in their lives 
came from their relationships with others, from their meaningful relationships, whether it was just a few or it was many, it came down to these connections with other people, of course, on a deeper than superficial level. And of course, for me, I thought of our divine friendship, that aspect or expression through Ananda that not only are we a community of individuals who are seeking God, but that it is inherently part of that seeking that we share with others and with one another, whether we've been friends you know, personally or not, known each other for a very long time or very little. Sometimes we haven't even met, but we just know of each other. Um, but there is an inherent and instinctual knowing that we are there on a much deeper than basic level to support one another. And this divine friendship springs from a natural love and compassion and kindness that propels us on to the path of God and in attunement with God. There was another researcher that I heard of, uh, a famous anthropologist called Mar I think her name is Margaret Mead. And uh, she had done some studies and was being interviewed and asked about what were the very earliest signs of civilization in, in humankind. And she didn't reference clay pots or, or grinding stones like some people thought, but she said that the first sign of civilization, in her opinion, was uh, evidence of a broken bone, a femur from an early human that had shown it had healed, it had repaired. And the reason why, she said, is that the first sign of civilization starts when individuals are cooperating together. And she said uh, a creature would never survive in the wilderness in these early times with a, a break like that unless it was nurtured and helped by another. And so she referenced that we are naturally at our best when we are helping others and that humanity begins just as our spirituality begins or is built upon this and these relationships with others, this kindness and this cooperation and this harmony. I'll just share with you one more story that happened uh, recently in my life, just a few weeks ago. Um, my, many of you know that as part of my service here locally, along with some others from Ananda, is to work with the local volunteer fire department. And there's a number of uh, chiefs, fire chiefs in our fire department, one of which is our deputy chief, who I can only describe as a, a living legend. He's a like a seventh generation uh, local cattle farmer. He just lives a couple miles from here. And his name's Tom. He's an older gentleman who's been in the fire service for something like 50 years. And he's extremely well respected. Um, he's a great leader and, and speaker. He's a very kind and he's a funny, you know, humorous person. He's really like a teacher and a counselor is in terms we would often use um, in many ways. And even in his retirement now for I think more than a decade. He serves uh, like mad at our department and with these interagency things and on these big uh, fire management teams that manage the large fires in California and elsewhere. And his name's Tom. He recently had a major surgery for, on his knee and it went okay, but he's been in a lot of pain and he's got several months now of recovery and he's just laid up at home. As I said, he lives nearby and after his surgery, I reached out to him. I was just thinking of how he was doing and sent him a text message. And I said, are you taking visitors? Tom, how's it going? And he said, sure, come on by. So we coordinated a time the next week when I went to visit Tom. I brought him some banana bread and we talked and just kind of chatted. And he was and has been in a lot, a lot of pain. It's been a very painful and challenging process. And I think I kind of lifted his spirits a little bit, and so that was nice. And I said, if you ever need anything, you know, feel free to call. Of course, you know, me or somebody from the department, somebody would love to you know, lend a hand. And so that was that. A few days later, or later in that week, he contacted me and he said, you said to call if, you know, I ever need help. And I said, of course, what is it? He said, well, I need a hand getting into the car tomorrow. I have to go see the orthopedic doctor. I said, sure, I'll be there. It was lunchtime, I popped over. He said, oh, and do you know anybody that has a wheelchair? You know, I need to borrow a wheelchair. I said, sure, I think I do. And Karuna here in the community was kind enough to facilitate a loaner. So I brought him a wheelchair. And he said, one more thing. And I said, what is it? He said, well, 
I've been in all this pain, and I've really been struggling with this process of recovery. And I said, yeah, Tom, what is it? He said, well, I was thinking, who better to ask to help me? I said, yeah, with something. <laughs> I said, what is it, Tom? He said, well, is there like some breathing or some meditation I can do <laughs> to help me get through this? And I said, I think we could talk about that a little bit, Tom. I'll come by early tomorrow or Friday, whatever it was. And so I went and visited with Tom and it was beautiful. You know, he's not a deeply spiritual person, but he's a deeply good person. And we talked a little bit about spiritual things and I taught him to meditate and I, I gave him a little bit of pranayama, some breathing techniques that I think they helped. But I think also that God used me in whatever little way he could or I could be soul receptive to help somebody, you know, just by thinking of others and by basic goodness and kindness. And so we set up a meal train and different people have been going to visit Tom and, and he's doing better and by and by. And, and we see this almost naturally. It's the norm in, in our community, but it's not, I can tell you for, for Tom or for some people in the world that we just help one another. That God flows through us as channels in attunement, you know, to be good, to be channels for God's goodness. And the last aspect, of attunement that I'd like to touch on this morning is that of all of these principles of being in tune with God, ultimately we have to go within. That saint that I referenced in the autobiography of a yogi, Ram Gopal Musamdar, he said to Yogananda, who was always crazy about seeking God and finding God, he said, have you a little room where you can go and close the door and be alone? And of course, Yogananda said yes, and who among us can't find a little closet or something somewhere? And he said, that is where you will find God. That is your sacred mountain. That is where you will find the kingdom of God. And so for each of us, ultimately, it comes down to being with God in the self within. As Yogananda said, to dwell in the self and come down as needed to be with others, to talk, to eat, and to be social, whatever it may be. And then he said, return to the self and, and just live in that self within. And so ultimately this attunement with God, with the guru as an expression of God, it's a complicated and individual thing. But things like devotion and right attitude and loyalty will keep us in tune and on the path to God and discipleship and these different expressions of our attunement, it's not something that is like a switch that's either on or off. It's a flow in our lives. And as long as we are loving God, seeing God in others and helping God in others and trying our best to live in his presence, then we will be in tune and we will find God. Bless you all. Like a ghost or high on the earth, be strong.
is despair. Yeah. 